Good morning, my name is Carrie Pillay, and I'm going to spend some time uh, talking to you about alcohol, how it's used in our society, how it affects our society, how it affects us directly by our own use, and how it affects us indirectly by the way others in our society are using it. And then in the end, we're going to look at some of the things you probably know about alcohol. I find that a lot of us know a lot about alcohol. It is the number one preferred drug in the United States. Number one. Marijuana, meth, all that other stuff, not even close. Two-thirds of our population use alcohol. Two-thirds. Two-thirds of our population do not smoke pot. Two-thirds of our population use alcohol. We got one-third that don't drink, don't use alcohol at all. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So it's by far the leading drug used by the people in our country. What I'm going to look at as we talk about this is how it got to be where it is. Because one, one of the comments that I always get when, I t when we talk about drugs is, you know, alcohol really is a problem. It ought to be illegal. I wouldn't tell you that I don't disagree with you. It is a problem. It's a huge problem. It costs us lots of money. Because it's the number one drug, though, it only got to be that way because of the way that we are exposing ourselves to it. We make it OK. We have it around us so much that we're not even aware of most of the bombardment we get with advertising and exposure to different forms of alcohol. And that's significant because when we were talking last week about habits and patterns, when it's just always kind of there in the periphery and we get used to it, it can affect the choices that I make about using or not using and when. And that's how it kind of gets in, gets in with us. So we're going to look at how it's been ingrained into our society, how it's encouraged, okay? how it's, a, a, how it's a really a tradition for a lot of people in our country. It's an expected part of stuff that goes on. And then how it is affecting our lives. Uh, as a societal level, that's that indirect, how you are actually paying <laughs> for a lot of people using alcohol, even if you don't use. And then how, it, how you are paying directly when you choose to, when you choose to use. When, we talk, when I talk about this idea that it's economically ingrained, that means that it's been put into place and it's, it's such a part of our society that if we chose as, an, as a society to make it illegal, uh, we, a lot of us would go bankrupt because there are a lot of jobs associated with alcohol. Production, distribution from the people that make it and distribute it in trucks and big kennels to the bartender or the grocery store that sells it locally to the consumer. Huge, huge uh, industry there. We spend $90 billion a year on alcohol. $90 billion. That's a lot of zeros, isn't it? I mean, we talk about some of the things when we look at our national budget that have those kinds of, those kinds of price tags on it. And this is what we as consumers spend, $90 billion a year on alcohol. That is a huge chunk of money. Local governments are dependent on the sales of alcohol. I think in Florida we might have one county that's dry. Up in uh, Georgia, they have a couple of counties that are dry. I got some head nods, so you've heard of that or been in them. <laughs> dry means they don't sell. So they don't, have, they don't have bars, they don't have liquor stores or distribute in their supermarkets. They don't sell alcohol. So guess what? Their revenues for that county are not dependent on the taxes that are generated from the sale of alcohol. The rest of us are. And you saw what we spend, right? Well, layered into the sale of alcohol are about 300% tax. 300% tax. If you've ever traveled outside of the United States, if you've been on a cruise or you've been to another country or you could go into a duty-free store and buy, you can see the huge difference between what you can buy it for when you don't pay our taxes and what you're buying it for when you go to the ABC. There's about a 300% markup. And those are taxes at all layers. If you buy in the city of Tampa, the city of Tampa has a sales tax. Hillsborough County has a sales tax. The state of Florida has a sales tax. The federal government has a sales tax. And so we're paying at least four levels of tax when we buy alcohol to the tune of about a 300% markup. Hmm. Okay. And we're, we're supporting ourselves on that. So the mayor of Tampa, when he looks at the budget, looks at what, what 
was generated from liquor tax last year and projects what he can count on this year and that's how he comes up that's how he says well here's I think the money that we're going to be collecting so that we can pay for police and pay for fire and pay for garbage and pay for sewage and pay for the water plant and pay for all of that you wouldn't believe all the stuff that goes on in running a city and the money we make from selling alcohol is a huge part of that budget if we tried to cut it out we'd have to cut back on police and fire and we'd probably pick up garbage every two weeks can you imagine what your house would look like with your garbage pickup every two weeks I would be I need like extra cans <laughs> overflowing I couldn't do it okay and so it would be a mess if we tried to do that we're not going to once we are dependent on those kinds of taxes and income, we don't go back easily. We're kind of stuck. Socially encouraged. Okay, this is where we as people get bombarded with alcohol stuff around us. The average person sees a thousand beer commercials a year. The average person. Now, if you're a sports watcher, you see more than a thousand. I watch some sports like NASCAR like football, the Super Bowl's coming up, and you know every other commercial is going to be a beer commercial on that, right? And so if you are a sports enthusiast, one of the things that is associated with sports are alcohol for a lot of people, and so you're going to see my share of that not 1,000, <laughs> okay? But we see a lot of that, and we don't think about it. Now when you leave the room because you want to go get a snack, what happens to the volume on that commercial? It goes up because we want you to hear it from the refrigerator. That's one way that we continue to bombard you. You're not even present to see it, but you can hear it from the next area. They do that on purpose, okay, to keep it there in the background, the periphery of your mind. Um, the liquor industry spends $2 billion a year on advertising. We spend $90 billion in turn, and they spend $2 billion, keeping, it, keeping us aware of it. Okay? So that's things like billboards. I drive around town. I, and I'm more aware when I know I'm going to do the alcohol talk as what's up, what billboards are currently up. Have you seen the billboards with the shark tail on them? What is that advertising? Land shark. I didn't know what that was the first time I saw it, but as I was turning to come to the office, I saw this billboard in the distance with the shark tail on it, and I, got, I said, I wonder what that is. It was about six years ago when land shark was new. It got my attention. So when I was driving by one and saw it, I'm, oh, look at that. And then the next time I went into the grocery store, I wanted to see what it looked like. I'm purposefully aware, but a lot of us aren't. We stall the billboard, oh, it's new, I'm gonna go in, hey, you know what? We may inadvertently pick it up because we saw a billboard over here. That's what they want. I may not be actively thinking about it, but it's there in the back of my mind. At the corner of Malfunction Junction, Publix owns that. Public zones that Corona had it for a while, a couple years ago, and they had this beach chair and a little six pack sitting next to it in the summer. You know, and that was like so much taste, so little time. And so you would drive by it and see the little beach chair and go, oh, what a great. And then next to it is the, is the message about and the cold beer on the beach. See how they, they rein us in? Oh, you go into the store and you know, I'm going to the beach and you know, well, you know, that's not such a bad idea, whether you're actively thinking about that billboard you saw or not. It's there. Yep. We also get bombarded, you know, just as a part. NASCAR I'm not big on, but just other exposure. I turned on NASCAR because somebody said, oh, you wouldn't believe all the advertising for beer with NASCAR. And I'm thinking, I watch football. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, the commercial's between. And they said, no, 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 no. No, 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 the drivers are endorsed by. And so I said, okay, I'll turn it on and look. And they're right. I mean, here comes the Bud Light car, <laughs> painted in red, and the guy gets out, and he's got it all over his suit. And I'm like, wow. I mean, it's right there in your face, right there in your face with NASCAR. Bombarded. You know, I may not know the driver's name, but I know he drives the Mick Light car. Woo! When I go to the store, I'm more likely to do what? Well, my favorite driver does is supports this, and so maybe I'll try that. And I become a Mick Light person. It's all around us. So they spend that on advertising, and they still advertise in magazines, right? So you see that. They advertise on TV. They advertise on billboards. Can you think of any other advertisements? Radio. Yeah, they do advertise on radio. They sure do. I'm, I guess I'm probably not as aware of that one because I'm not a very audible person. It doesn't always catch my ear. 
What do they do on the Corona commercial? They open the beer and you hear it fizzing? You see the, the beach and it's like, you hear the brains. <laughs> They've just totally got you thinking about it. Oh my gosh, I have not heard of that commercial on the radio. I'll have to listen for it. But there you go. I mean, it's just all around us purposefully. We get bom I call it bombardment. A lot of it we're not aware of, but that's the whole idea. They subliminally want us to, in the back of our mind, have that awareness that we don't consciously have. Because when I choose to buy or to use, it increases my likelihood that I might use their product. And then finally, the availability. Oh my gosh, that's gone up. That has hugely gone up. When I moved to Florida 20 years ago, and you would go into the grocery store, they just had like an aisle that they had the alcohol on to include the wine. So they had some cold, and then they had a little bit of wine, and then they had the, the uh, not cold beer in like the 12 packs or whatever. And that was pretty much it. And on the other side was the potato chips, <laughs> the snacks that we associate with us, which is how they drag us down that aisle. Because they put the stuff, that snack food, across from it. And then what? Oh, while I'm here, I'll pick up a six pack. I mean, they're really hoping. They're gunning that we're going to do that. And so we get these associations going. Well, the availability has truly expanded <laughs> in the last 20 years. I go into my Publix now. They've, re they've remodeled. And they don't keep wine on the aisle anymore. Back. Next to the deli, they have a whole wine section with low lighting and special music. In my grocery store, I can't find shampoo in the grocery store anymore. I think they've gotten rid of it because they make a lot more money selling wine, I guess. I don't know. But it's way bigger. They have the whole row of, of beer now with expanded stuff and some of, the, some of the cold. And some of the grocery stores have the cooler in the back so you can buy it in larger volumes, right? And we're just talking about grocery stores. Next to the grocery store is what? The grocery liquor store, right. And so if you need a keg or you need truly large volumes, you can head over there. They've probably got it in their back cooler cold for you. So if they don't have it where you're looking, man, you don't have to go far. See how we hook this in? Okay. Um, convenience stores are another place that it's gone up. My convenience store around the corner where I'll go buy gas, occasionally I go in because I need milk. <laughs> That's my only reason for going in because I can pay at the pump. But occasionally I have to go in to get something and one day I did go in to buy milk and I had to ask where it was because it was not evident to me where this might be with all of these cases and stacks. They have soda but lots of stacks of beer and when I could see in the cooler all I could see was beer in the back and they're like well it's back in the corner way in the far left corner over there. Okay you're sure? Yeah yeah it's at the bottom. So I walk back and sure enough there's the milk <laughs> and then the bologna and the cheese and then we start with the single cans of beer and we just go this way with single cans and six packs of all kinds of stuff and then 12 packs of all kinds of stuff and if I need it I don't need it cold it's behind me stacked on the floor warm and I can do that and lots of times they do have a cooler with larger amounts in the back. So I pick up my milk and I'm noticing as I'm walking back to the front there's this, this big tub on ice sitting at the counter and I'm like well what the heck is that I don't go in very often and I look over and it's like if in case I forgot in case I forgot while I was in the back that I wanted a 32 ounce of some beer, it's right there cold for me. My last chance. <laughs> you know, it's like last chance before you head out the door. We'll put it in a brown paper bag for you. Holy cow. It is just everywhere. You go into these little, these little convenience stores and whew, again, bombarded. Okay. And that's on purpose. We want you to have one last chance. We just have it all around us. We socially encourage it socially encourage it. Thirdly, a lot of alcohol use has been tied into tradition. So when we think about our habits and our patterns of use, a lot of families and a lot of social events have had alcohol linked to them. A lot of us expect that alcohol will be available there. Some of us would say, I can't go <laughs> if there's not going to be any alcohol. And I'll tell you, if you say things like that, you need to think about what your use looks like because you could have an issue. So let's talk about some of these. Sports we've already talked about. Huge. Huge. You go to an ice hockey game, they got people running up and down the aisle with the big things on selling you warm, nasty beer, right? And if you don't want that, you can go back up to the top deck and you can buy hard liquor and better cold beer or whatever. Okay? But they'll bring it to you. Football's the same way, right? Yeah, sure is. I don't do tennis. I don't know about tennis. Maybe they do wine at tennis. I don't know. Okay, but sports, it's hugely, hugely encouraged. 
What about in um, religious events? Okay, when we took it, when we look at Christian religious events, yeah, Catholics have communion, Lutherans have communion. What do we do at communion? Yeah, some of them use grape juice now, if they're not advocating alcohol. But it used to be wine. My minister at my my Lutheran church has a goblet. They do this whole table layout thing. Any of you seen this? It's like a big event. They have communion. And he would put wine in it, and then I, knew, I asked him one day, because he didn't put very much in it. And sacramental wine is 17% alcohol. Most of the wine that we buy at the grocery store is 11, maybe 12. 17%. So Pastor Bob says, I don't put much in it, Carrie, because if you look at when I close out the ceremony, I have to drink what's in the goblet. <laughs> it took him one time drinking two of those Sunday morning, and by noon, shaking people's hand coming out. He can barely stand. I don't put much in there because, wow, I don't drink much and it goes right to my head. But we use it as a part of our communion ceremonies and some of our religious stuff. How about when we go to weddings? We don't necessarily have it at the wedding unless we're Catholic or Lutheran and, and have a communion, but when we go to the wedding reception, the party afterwards, how many of you have been to a, to a wedding that didn't have alcohol served? You have been to, you're the only one, I, you and me, the only ones in the room. How was it? It was family. You know. It was family. <laughs> so we had some fun. I've been to two. One wasn't so fun, but that's because I don't polka. No alcohol, and we're going to polka. <laughs> the other one had a really good DJ. I'll tell you, people were a little hesitant at first because, you know, a lot of us have learned to do what, what at parties. We drink a little bit, and then we, we pretend it's the alcohol doing the fun or the crazy things that we do, and we blame it on that. Well, we can't do that when we're, there hadn't been any alcohol, right? So it's all me. And so it took a little while for people to kind of let their hair down and start moving at that other one. But it does happen. Some people, though, won't go to a wedding. Or they'll say, you know, I'm going to drink before I go. That's their solution. I'll just have some before I go. OK, that could be a problem. How about 4th of July? Beverage for 4th of July? Beer. Yeah, beer. Anything else? That's the big one I, that comes to my mind, too. But it can be different in families. So my family, we had, a, we had a cooler with soda in it for the kids. And we had a cooler with beer in it for the adults. Right? And, I, and we didn't use a lot of hard liquor, so I'm, I'm with you with beer there. How about Christmas? We just came through the holidays. What's the beverage we use for Christmas? Eggnog. Yeah, anything else? Mimosas. Mimosas, which is champagne with a little orange juice for that morning after hangover. Anything else? Yeah, my, my family liked bourbon slushes growing up. Bourbon slushes in a big punch bowl. I, I, th I know, I look back at my family and they're a little <laughs> we were a little different. As I look back, I thought that was normal and I'm like, mm, really not, really not so normal. But you see how it gets tied in? How about when you go to a, a, a family reunion? Any of you do that where we have family get-togethers? What happens at those? Shots. Shots. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, just about anything. So we might have beer and we have mixed cocktails. Maybe we're doing margaritas or daiquiris. And sure, we can have shots if we've got all that other stuff out. Absolutely. Okay. And some of us have families that say, well, we don't drink. And that, that is the case. A third of families don't drink, but a lot of families do, and the majority of us have been exposed. So we saw our, our family showed us how to use it. We now are adults, and we make choices on our own, and society helps us by reminding us that it's there, and it encourages us to use it, and we're going we're gonna to maintain this as the number one drug in the United States for the unforeseeable future. I can't imagine it changing. I can't, even though we have huge issues with it. Okay, so let's talk about this alcohol that goes on in our country. Okay, I've told you two thirds of our population use. At the last census, I think we had just over 400 million people. So two thirds of that's going to be what, 100 and, uh, 260 million, 270 million, something like that. So keep that number in mind. Let's. I want you to think about, and I'm going to ask you to come up with a number. How much? we consume of each type of liquor, okay? So, and it's gotta be in gallons. I found, a, I found a study that showed me some of this and I thought it was really cool, so I'm gonna have you think about it. How many gallons of beer would 400 million people need to drink a year to equal what we actually sell? 
Now it takes 10 beers to be a gallon. Okay, so what do you think? Gallon. Maybe 25 gallons? Maybe 10 gallons? I mean, this is everybody. 400 million people would have to drink this. Got a number in mind? 100 gallons? 150 gallons? 75 gallons? Maybe 350 gallons. Okay. See, we're getting some numbers. Everybody's got some kind of idea in their mind? Here we go. 25. So everybody, 400 million people would have to drink 250 beers a year. I know some people that drink a lot more than that. <laughs> I know some people that don't drink beer at all. So we kind of get this shuffle. And then we already mentioned we got a third of our population that doesn't drink. Okay. How much wine would everybody have to drink in gallons? The bottle is like a liter. So it takes a little over two of those to be a gallon. So how many gallons of wine do you think people would have to drink in here? 400 million people. Eight. Eight. Not as much, huh? Okay. Two. We don't sell as much wine. And wine is kind of one of those preferred things. A lot of more people use beer than use wine, obviously, right? <laughs> Some people don't drink beer, they only drink wine. Some people only drink wine if they go to a wedding or something because that's what they have there that's for free sitting on the table, right? Yeah. How about hard liquor? That's things like rum and vodka and, that, and mixed drinks and that kind of stuff. How many gallons would everybody have to drink? 1, 2, 10, 25, 100? 30. 30. Ready? One and a half. So we have far fewer people drinking liquor. Beer is, beer is the commodity. Well, think about your grocery store. It's cheaper. Yeah, it's cheaper. I gotta drink more by volume because beer, most beer is 6%. Liquor is proof, and proof, <laughs> 70 proof, is 35%. Cut it in half, that tells you the percent of alcohol. So it's much more potent than beer, and a lot of people drink beer as a beverage. So that's what, that's what we have. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more interesting because I keep telling you, only two-thirds of our population drink alcohol, which means we have 130 million people that don't use. That leaves us 270 million people that are drinking, drinking. Okay, well that means that the 270 million have got to consume more because we got 130 that don't drink. This was across our entire population. But some of us know people that we would say, 